The Path to Prosperity by James Allen Forward. I looked around upon the world, and saw that it was shattered by sorrow and scorched by the fierce fires of suffering. And I looked for the cause. I looked around, but could not find it. I looked in books, but could not find it. I looked within, and found there both the cause and the self-made nature of that cause. I looked again, and deeper, and found the remedy. I found one law, the law of love, one life, the life of adjustment to that law, one truth, the truth of a conquered mind and a quiet and obedient heart. And I dreamed of writing a book which should help men and women, whether rich or poor, learned or unlearned, worldly or unworldly, to find within themselves the source of all success, all happiness, all accomplishment, all truth. And the dream remained with me, and at last became substantial, and now I send it forth into the world on its mission of healing and blessedness, knowing that it cannot fail to reach the homes and hearts of those who are waiting and ready to receive it. James Allen Chapter 1 The Lesson of Evil Unrest and pain and sorrow are the shadows of life. There is no heart in all the world that has not felt the sting of pain. No mind has not been tossed upon the dark waters of trouble. No eye that has not wept the hot blinding tears of unspeakable anguish. There is no household where the great destroyers, disease and death, have not entered, severing heart from heart, and casting over all the dark pall of sorrow. In the strong and apparently indestructible meshes of evil, all are more or less fast caught, and pain, unhappiness, and misfortune wait upon mankind. With the object of escaping, or in some way mitigating this overshadowing gloom, men and women rush blindly into innumerable devices pathways by which they fondly hope to enter into a happiness which will not pass away. Such are the drunkard and the harlot, who revel in sensual excitements. Such is the exclusive esthete, who shuts himself out from the sorrows of the world, and surrounds himself with innovating luxuries. Such is he who thirsts for wealth or fame, and subordinates all things to the achievement of that object and such are they who seek consolidation in the performance of religious rites. And to all the happiness sought seems to come, and the soul, for a time, is lulled into a sweet security and an intoxicating forgetfulness of the existence of evil. But the day of disease comes at last, or some great sorrow, temptation, or misfortune breaks suddenly in on the unfortified soul, and the fabric of its fancied happiness is torn to shreds. So over the head of every personal joy hangs the Democletian sword of pain, ready, at any moment, to fall and crush the soul of him who is unprotected by knowledge. The child cries to be a man or woman. The man and woman sigh for the lost felicity of childhood. The poor man chafes under the chains of poverty by which he is bound, and the rich man often lives in fear of poverty, or scours the world in search of an elusive shadow he calls happiness. Sometimes the soul feels that it has found a secure peace and happiness in adopting a certain religion, in embracing an intellectual philosophy, or in building up an intellectual or artistic ideal. But some overpowering temptation proves the religion to be inadequate or insufficient. The theoretical philosophy is found to be a useless prop, or in a moment, the idealistic statue upon which the devotee has for years been labouring is shattered into fragments at his feet. Is there, then, no way of escape from pain and sorrow? Are there no means by which bonds of evil may be broken? Is permanent happiness, secure prosperity, an abiding peace a foolish dream? No, there is a way, and I speak it with gladness by which evil can be slain forever. There is a process by which disease, poverty, or any adverse condition or circumstance can be put on one side, never to return. 
there is a method by which a permanent prosperity can be secured, free from all fear of the return of adversity, and there is a practice by which unbroken and unending peace and bliss can be partaken of and realized. And the beginning of the way which leads to this glorious realization is the acquirement of a right understanding of the nature of evil. It is not sufficient to deny or ignore evil. It must be understood. It is not enough to pray to God to remove the evil. You must find out why it is there, and what lesson it has for you. It is of no avail to fret and fume and chafe at the chains which bind you. You must know why and how you are bound. Therefore, reader, you must get outside yourself, and must begin to examine and understand yourself. You must cease to be a disobedient child in the school of experience, and must begin to learn, with humility and patience, the lessons that are set for your edification and ultimate perfection. For evil, when rightly understood, is found to be not an unlimited power or principle in the universe, but a passing phase of human experience, and it therefore becomes a teacher to those who are willing to learn. Evil is not an abstract something outside yourself, it is an experience in your own heart, and by patiently examining and rectifying your heart, you will be gradually led into the discovery of the origin and nature of evil, which will necessarily be followed by its complete eradication. All evil is corrective and remedial, and is therefore not permanent. It is rooted in ignorance, ignorance of the true nature and relation of things, and so long as we remain in that state of ignorance, we remain subject to evil. There is no evil in the universe which is not the result of ignorance, and which would not, if we were ready and willing to learn its lesson, lead us to higher wisdom, and then vanish away. But men remain in evil, and it does not pass away, because men are not willing or prepared to learn the lesson which it came to teach them. I knew a child who, every night when its mother took it to bed, cried to be allowed to play with the candle, and one night, when the mother was off guard for a moment, the child took hold of the candle, the inevitable result followed, and the child never wished to play with the candle again. By its one foolish act it learned, and learned perfectly the lesson of obedience, and entered into the knowledge that fire burns. And, this incident is a complete illustration of the nature, meaning, and ultimate result of all sin and evil. As the child suffered through its own ignorance of the real nature of fire, so older children suffer through their ignorance of the real nature of the things which they weep for and strive after and which harm them when they are secured. The only difference being that in the latter case, the ignorance and evil are more deeply rooted and obscure. Evil has always been symbolized by darkness, and good by light, and hidden within the symbol is contained the perfect interpretation, the reality, or, just as light always floods the universe, and darkness is only a mere speck or shadow cast by a small body intercepting a few rays of the illimitable light. So the light of the supreme good is the positive and life-giving power which floods the universe, and evil, the insignificant shadow cast by the self that intercepts and shuts off the illuminating rays which strive for entrance. When night folds the world in its black impenetrable mantle, no matter how dense the darkness, it covers but the small space of half our little planet, while the whole universe is ablaze with living light, and every soul knows that it will awake in the light in the morning. Know, then, that when the dark night of sorrow, pain, or misfortune settles down upon your soul, and you stumble along with weary and uncertain steps, that you are merely intercepting your own personal desires between yourself in the boundless light of joy and bliss, and the dark shadow that covers you is cast by none and nothing but yourself. And just as the darkness without is but a negative shadow, an unreality which comes from nowhere, goes to nowhere, and has no abiding dwelling place, so the darkness within is equally a negative shadow, 
passing over the evolving and light born soul. But, I fancy I hear someone say, why pass through the darkness of evil at all? Because, by ignorance you have chosen to do so, and because, by doing so, you may understand both good and evil, and may more appreciate the light by having passed through the darkness. As evil is the direct outcome of ignorance, so, when the lessons of evil are fully learned, ignorance passes away, and wisdom takes its place. But as a disobedient child refuses to learn its lessons at school, so it is possible to refuse to learn the lessons of experience, and thus remain in continual darkness, and to suffer continually recurring punishments in the form of disease, disappointment, and sorrow. He, therefore, who would shake himself free of the evil which encompasses him, must be willing and ready to learn, and must be prepared to undergo that disciplinary process without which no grain of wisdom or abiding happiness and peace can be secured. A man may shut himself up in a dark room, and deny that the light exists, but it is everywhere without, and darkness exists only in his own little room. So you may shut out the light of truth, or you may begin to pull down the walls of prejudice, self-seeking, and error, which you have built around yourself, and so let in the glorious and omnipresent light. By earnest self-examination, strive to realize, and not merely hold as a theory, that evil is a passing phase, a self-created shadow, that all your pains, sorrows, and misfortunes have come to you by a process of undeviating and absolutely perfect law, have come to you because you deserve and require them, and that by first enduring, and then understanding them, you may be made stronger, wiser, nobler. When you have fully entered into this realization, you will be in a position to mold your own circumstances, to transmute all evil into good, and to weave, with a master hand, the fabric of your destiny. What of the night, O watchman, seest thou yet, the glimmering dawn upon the mountain heights, the golden herald of the light of lights? Are his fair feet upon the hilltop set? Cometh he yet to chase away the gloom, and with it all the demons of the night? Strike yet his darting rays upon thy sight? Hearest thou his voice, the sound of error's doom? The morning cometh, lover of the light. Even now he kills with gold the mountain's brow. Dimly I see the path whereon even now his shining feet are set toward the night. Darkness shall pass away, and all the things that love the darkness and that hate the light shall disappear forever with the night. Rejoice, for thus the speeding herald sings. End of foreword.